Hi, this is Dave, and my objective here is just to carry on sharing some ideas, or reviewing some ideas, um, about, about the placenta, about the fetal and maternal flow in the placenta. So, um, one way that we could visualize this, just cutting to the chase, is almost to think of it as a sponge sitting in a bucket. And a sponge will represent the fetal circulation, and the bucket, the maternal circulation. And I'll show you really what I mean. So within the, the, the trabeculae of the sponge, in the open space of the sponge, in the porous space of the sponge, the maternal blood is. That, that's the, shown by the blue here. And, but within the walls itself, within the substance walls of the sponge, the fetal blood is flowing. And that's what I've shown in, in, in purple. And that's where the exchange occurs. And the fetal blood is coming in, you know, at a given pressure based on the pulsatile cardiac cycle. And it's coming out, you know, the venous waveform. So that, I guess, has some waveform, too. And that's the in and out at the fetal end right here and here. And the exchange is occurring across here. The exchange is occurring across here, sort of between the trabeculi of the sponge, meaning like the, 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 the matter of the sponge, and the open space of the sponge. And in the open space of the sponge is the maternal blood. And the maternal blood could be thought of really, you know, and that's sort of what Henning was saying, high conductance, low resistance, and an open tap. And that's filling up this bucket, and that's shown in blue. And so you have a maternal inflow and an outflow. And we have discussed whether the maternal flow comes in as a low resistance, sort of low, sort of low velocity jets, or AVM-like flow, some kind of myometrial vascular communication, but I don't think it matters. The main, well, it matters, and I'll, I'll tell you why I think it matters, but it doesn't matter for this model in that basically um, the, the tap is turned on and the blood is coming in, and what it'll do is it'll fill the volume of space that the placenta allows. So the flow rate, the maternal flow in this model is determined by the volume in the um, maternal space of the pl placenta, in the maternal space of the placenta, of the placenta. So that's what determines the maternal flow rate. The maternal flow rate of the mother, VM, is determined by the volume of the maternal space of the placenta. And just very, very quickly, the reason I, I think the and for the sake of the exchange calculations, I don't think whether jets or AVM type flow is important. I think the reason it'll be important is if you have jets, the flow is sort of discretized. And so it flows in here, and it'll flow in here. And then the problem that I see with that model, not the, not the shearing rheology. I, I, I think it'll be remodeled. I don't think, I mean, it's hard for me to imagine, you know, w and although, you know, people have written about it, that the flow could be forceful and shearing and cause damage to the villi, but it's hard to imagine that nature would ruin such a beautiful structure, would create such beautiful villi and then ruin them. That's hard for me to, to, to get into my head, but, but I guess it could happen. But for me, the main problem with the jet flow now, as I think of it, is that it's, it'll cause a lot of heterogeneity. There'll be sort of, you know, higher oxygen concentration here and lower oxygen concentration as you get to the water, watershed interfaces between the jets. Whereas you, if you have some kind of, you know, myometrial vascular anastomosis, you get more homogenization of the maternal flow because you want all the areas of the maternal flow to be relatively homogenized. And I think that would be an important part of the model. And also, you don't want it to be damaging. So that's why I, I, I like this better. I like the AVM quote-unquote model better than the jets. But I'm open, and it, it, it's all good. But that needs to be modeled. But I don't think regardless, and I agree with what Henning was saying, that's not totally crucial. The main thing is, is that you get a high conductance, low resistance maternal flow rate that's determined by the volume that the placenta allows. The fetal blood comes in, and the exchange occurs across, you know, this, this membrane. And now here's a crucial point that I, I, I want to make, and it's an intuitive point. I don't believe we have the data to back it up, but I think we should generate the data. And the point is, and this was said to me by several people, an engineer friend of mine, Jamie Chalmers, my friend Chris Ball, who's a fluid engineer, my student, who really, he's really my teacher, but institu in the context of the institution, he's my, my student, but in real life, he's actually my teacher, Dan Cornejo. And what they said to me is, think of this system, David, as a heat exchanger. It, what, 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 what engineers build as a heat exchanger. And that's so beautiful and so important. And listen to me, guys. The reason that that's so important is because this flow rate doesn't really matter so much. This flow rate, we'll call it V fetus, doesn't really matter so much. This volume 
doesn't really matter so much. The only thing that really matters are two things. The surface area of the fetal surface available to exchange and to a much smaller extent the maternal volume. But the real determinant, the real determinant is the fetal surface area. And that makes so much sense because as a pathologist, that's what I see growing. That's how the baby grows. Th the way the baby keeps up with his metabolic demands is by increasing and increasing and increasing the surface area for exchange in the placenta. So now we have to talk a little bit about scaling. So we have a little fetus, let's say a fetus at, you know, 10 weeks, and then it goes to the fetus at, let's say, 20 weeks, and then finally your fetus at term. And the fetus is scaling up. He's asking for more and more metabolic needs. But we could model the fetus as a sphere. It's r fetus is roughly spherical, and the fetal mass is what determines the, the, um, um, the, the, the metabolic needs. And so if you model it as a sphere, you could say, okay, well, the sphere the sphere mass and therefore its metabolic rate is inc increasing as per its rate, as per its volume. And the function of the volume to the radius is a cubic relationship. So you can imagine that the metabolic needs of the fetus scale up at the power of three relationship. So k to the power of three. Here it is. So this is the fetus's needs. And then the fetus is saying to the placenta, give me more, give me more, give me more, meet my needs because I need to scale up. And so the placenta is trying, but I'll, I'll ruin it right now. The, p the way the placenta does it is by increasing his surface area. See, it's all going to come together. And so by increasing the surface area, that type of growth is not exponential like this. It's fractal. And the fractal, because it's a surface area between the second and third dimension, because it's growing like a tree, the number, the, 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 the growth constant will be somewhere between two and three. So it'll, the function will look something like this. And that's a number, x to the power of a number that's between two and three. And so they'll be inherently, no matter what you do, an intersection point. And that makes sense, too. Because normally, I think the intersection point is timed by nature to come at around, let's say, 43 weeks. And delivery occurs earlier at 38 weeks, and you're OK. The reason we have intrauterine fetal demise and trouble is because sometime this intersection point is shifted in this direction. And it's coming too close where it's labor hasn't come on, and this point is not coupled with the onset of labor. There's no biological mechanism to inher inherently couple this intersection point. And, you know, the fetus could adjust this curve, the fetus could adjust his curve by growing smaller. The fetus could say, okay, well, I'll just grow a little bit smaller. And sometimes he'll keep his head the same size, but his body smaller, and that's th this whole notion of the growth pattern in IUGR. But all of that is reaction. And really, he's asking the placenta to scale up, and the placenta does what it can. But the placenta scales up with a different function, with a fractal function, where the fetus scales up with an exponential function, so they're going to collide. So how does the placenta scale up? Well, here's your placenta, and it's a fractal tree, let's just say that, and, and let's just accept that, f suspend disbelief, and say that. And so this fractal tree, let's say you've got some branches, can scale up in two ways. It could do this by, you know, really expanding out, by branching out, and therefore your, these new red uh, branches are added, but they're added in a large way. They're added in a growth way. So they're also increasing what, you, what I've shown in here, blue, the maternal volume. Or you could increase the complexity, that what I've shown here, you could increase the complexity, but, but at the same time you're increasing the complexity, you're not concomitantly increasing the volume. So let me show you again what I mean. So here you have your placenta. And there's two things that could happen, two contexts that could happen. In one context, the, 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 the baby is going, scale me up, scale me up, give me more. So things grow and things grow and things branch and your volume increases. That's this A. But in the other model, and this is your early onset IUGR model, something happens, and I won't discuss that now, but something happens that the volume is defined. Nature says, I'm sorry, you cannot go beyond this volume. Whatever this volume is, you cannot go beyond it. The volume is circumscribed. So the volume is held constant, and the only way the fetus could upscale his surface area is by increasing the complexity, and that's here. So that's B. So what's the difference between A and B? So one of the difference is, and this we know, so this will be like the early onset, B will be like an early onset IUGR placenta. So what are the consequences? Well, one consequence that I know is that we know that the resistance in B's fetal circulation is greater. That we know. That in these early onset IUGR cases, the resistance in the fetal circulation is going to be greater. 
The next thing that we know is that B has a lower ceiling for scaling. In other words, he's at increased risk for IUGR, preeclampsia, and even intrauterine fetal demise. E could increase his complexity, a surface area, B, but only so much. There's a limit to how much of this complexity that you can increase. And I show this sort of this complexity in these little yellow. So what I'm saying is that there's a lower ceiling for scaling. So this baby is at greater risk. Here there's more space. Here, there's a in baby A, there's a higher ceiling because this there's more space, so you could still generate more complexity, you know, let's say, you know, f you know, causing this sort of feathering out, so there's still room to scale. And the other point that I want to say is, n normally, by the time you get to term, you're at a point where you're only generating more complexity, there's no more room anyway. So it's naturally timed like that. But in this case, in B, the ceiling is lower. And so there's a lower ceiling for scaling. So I know this for sure, and I know this almost for sure. And now I'm going to make some guesses. I'm going to say that wh when both babies are still alive, let's say we look at them at 30 weeks or 28 weeks, and both babies are doing okay, this IUGR baby is adapting, it's not great, but he's adapting, my guess is that we should have roughly equivalent, roughly the same oxygen metabol oxygen concentrations and toxin concentrations in the fetal venous blood in both, in the umbilical venous blood in both of these fetuses. So this placenta, even though it's, open quotes, more riskier than this placenta, B is more risky than A, you're still getting good oxygen delivery, it's compensated by this generation of, 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 of complexity, and good toxin removal in the fetal blood. So this fetal surface area increase at this point is sufficient to overcome the con constraint on the overall volume, which let's face it is a constraint. Here the blue stippling is showing the maternal space. It's really a cons constraint on the maternal space. So my guess is you should have the roughly the same oxygen and toxin concentrations in the fetal effluent, in the fetal vascular effluent in both A and B. However, my guess is, is that there's greater I, my, the worst toxin I think, the worst biological toxins are protons. I think those are the most dangerous. So, so in, in, B, in B, I think the maternal venous local effluent, once it goes into the maternal blood, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll be diluted out. But the local effluent of the placenta in B of the maternal blood may have more protons and more and more toxins in the local venous effluent of the plus of, 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 uh, just in that local environment because the maternal volume is less here. So just the direct effluent. This, I think, is important if we're trying to think about preeclampsia. This local effect of these mediators, and maybe there could even be some systemic spillover, this is maybe what's responsible for the pathogenesis of preeclampsia. So really, you could think of it in this case. In, 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 in each case, the complexity of the surface area of the purple is increasing. But in case A, so too is this volume. And in case B, the volume is staying constant. So you can imagine the steady state of the maternal effluent, the, the concentration of toxins will be higher and the concentration of oxygen may be lower. But, you know, very roughly, and I could be making mistakes all over the place, but I'm just giving you the basic ideas. But the flow rates aren't so important. The main thing, just like in a heat exchanger, it's the surface area. It's the surface area that's the main point for, you know, for what determines uh, exchange. So at this level of granularity, I think this is something that we could begin to start thinking about in modeling. Because after all, we know the different weights of the placentas and how they correspond to the fetus at that different gestational age. What's really interesting is we could start going to real life cases and start looking at the surface area of the, th we, look, we could look histologically and using stereology at a surface area that's available for exchange. That we could do. And we could use in vitro perfusion to, to, to even all, to, to, to calculate, you know, the fetal, use, uh, you know, fetal and, and maternal exchanges. And we could relate the exchange to the complexity, the amount of volume available for surface area that we could look at histologically. And we could show, you know, what those relationships are. That's something that we could look at. And then we could look at stereology, the volume of the placenta from which the stereology is done, the mass of the placenta that which is done, the, 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 the weight of the fetus, and the complexity of the surface areas. We could even do that in conjunction with 
metabolite and toxin extraction, exchange data for in, from in vitro perfusion, and we could really solve the nature of this curve, which will be exactly what the numbers are, like what's the sort of density of s exchange surface area um, that, 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 that allows for the scaling of exchange. So I, I may be a little imprecise, but I know that it's a combination of looking at the complexity on the stereology, because the stereology, you know, you could take a placenta and you could take a few random sections. You could take a few random sections and you could basically, using stereology, approximate the surface area of, 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 of available for exchange in the entire disk. And you could look at exchange parameters in an in vitro perfusion, and then we could make some assumptions. And also using our intuition that, you know, usually around, let's say, f you know, after term, there's going to be an inherent intersection where the placenta can't scale up anymore. And this is a level of granularity that I think it would be very, very productive to think at. And it could couple stereology with in vitro perfusion and exchange and, and also thinking just about fetal me metabolics and kinetics. So thank you very much for listening.